about 30% of the time, getting about 80% there. And then the last majority of your time will be spent finishing it up. So what I'm doing really is I'm following this claw up the ball. This B tool will, will take out a, a nice big slice, and on the bottom of the foot here, I've scribed a circle. And so there's a circle here that's about three and three quarters inches, almost four inches in diameter. And so that circle will be the footprint where the ball actually sits on the floor. And so at each of these corners, there's space left for the claws. And so that's how that's how the thought process goes of, uh, of doing this. And most every ball and claw is laid out the same way. There really aren't uh, too many major variations. I mean, there are little details that change. But the, uh, the essential method of doing it, I, I really use the same method on pretty much every style that I'm carving. On this particular one, the side claws, instead of going straight down, the two side ones will curl back a little bit around the ball. And some of the ones that are out there have it. Some don't. I think the one that Dr. Beck has curls back a little bit. Um, and so you can notice on the ones that you've, you've got in your hands how they vary. And so in this case, I'm actually going to push the claw not exactly on the floor. I'm going to push it back a little tiny bit. So that it starts to curl around. And so I've just, you may get some chips on you, John. Uh, so I've just sketched a few outlines on here to give me an idea. Here we go. And so the major things I need to know are. One of the major things I need to know is how high is that web? How high is the, is the visible ball that we're going to see? And so on the side here, I'm not just going to rub this up. The other thing you need to do when you're carving is be able to use either hand. How do you choose a weight of metal? Um, I tend to like light mallets that are balanced. Uh, see how big the handle is in this one? It's got a big fat handle relative to the mallet. This way I can just pivot it here with my fingers and just flick it. If you have a mallet that's too top heavy, your, your wrist works too hard. So I like them small and I can get them moving fast. Most people that I teach come with these big giant mallets and I tell them to don't use that. It's going to hurt your wrist and you really don't need that big a mallet. It's more finesse than, than brute strength. Um, in mahogany, you can actually push. Well, mahogany varies a lot, but uh, you can actually just push this tool without a mallet. But when I'm roughing it out, I like to use a mallet just because it's faster. And, uh, you have a lot of control with the mallet because you smack it and it just goes a little bit and it stops. You know, hit it, stops, hit it, stops. If you're, using, if you're doing it by hand, if you don't have really good control, that thing can get away from you. And you'll take a chunk out of something that you really don't want to get rid of. And so, I use a mallet because it's quick and it gives me that control. So those are radically different already. And, you know, what happens in, in carving is that sometimes you have this urge to sketch everything on there. But after the first couple cuts, your sketches are gone. So drawing on on it, drawing too much detail on the wood really doesn't help you too much because it's just not there long enough. Um, so what I've done is just rough out the locations of the claws. And the height in the back, these arches in the back, will be the height of the ball in the back. And so these outside claws are going to come up and curl around this way. And the front claw is just going to come straight up the middle. The front claw is the, the guide post. That one is just dead straight. 
these side ones come down and then they'll hook back a little bit. The back one is also dead straight perpendicular to the floor. And so just by these first few cuts, I've located these elements in space so that I can go and do further details on them. So once I've roughed them out, I'll take a tool, I think, Uh, I'll take something and I'll start to actually round the claws off right away. So this is a gouge that I've ground specifically really to do this. And so I come up from the floor, right in the corner, I'm just kind of round this right over. And it'll go all the way up to the ankle. And the ones that you're holding, you'll see that there's a transition between the claw and the ankle. It comes up and it blends into the ankle. So what I'm going to do here on the side one is uh, the other important thing that I need to know is the height of the knuckle. So if you look at these ones you're holding, each, there are three knuckles on each claw and there's a height <laughs> off the floor. So each knuckle it has a distance that it needs to be off the floor. And so on this one, I'm just going to guess, we'll have three. So first one's about there, second one's about there, and the third one's about higher. So I'll just pencil those in. And I can change things as I go to a certain extent. Um, there really aren't that many mistakes that are complete showstoppers. Um, usually I can change them and make them work if I make a mistake. Um, so I'm not too worried. I tell my students the difference between you and me is I don't care if I make a mistake, you do. <laughs> You know, you get very invested in stuff once you start working on it, especially students, and so they don't want to make a mistake. But you know how it is with mistakes. You have to make them. So I'm starting to locate these knuckles. And then this top one will blend right into the ankle. And I can, mahogany is great for carving because you can hear it. It's nice and fine grain, so you can get nice detail, but the stuff that's carvable is soft enough so that it's not too much of a battle. Um, people come to me and they say, well, I'll make a sample in maple before I use mahogany. It's like, oh my god, if you make a sample in maple, you'll just quit and go back to whatever it was you used to do for a hobby. It's just too much work. This stuff, I mean, I buy it locally from lumber yards. There's one in uh, York, Maine, Maine Coast Lumber. There are a couple down in Massachusetts. Um, it comes from Central and South America, is the country of origin. Um, and there are varying qualities <clears throat> of mahogany. Uh, it varies a great deal. Um, some of it is really, really hard and dense. That short little Newport claw that's floating around somewhere, that one, if you feel that one, that's heavy stuff. That's really dense mahogany. Um, it doesn't mean it's going to be necessarily harder to carve. It's just uh, different. Um, and some mahogany is almost like balsa wood. It's really, really soft. And so uh, from different parts of the world, you get different qualities of mahogany. I don't use African mahogany because it's too stringy. I don't use Philippine mahogany for the same reason. Um, South American mahogany from uh, Honduras, Peru, Bolivia, Ecuador, Brazil is the stuff that's, that's really suitable for the type of work I'm doing. So right now I'm locating these claw, these knuckles, as they sort of arcade up the front of the piece. And I'll hold this up again in a second. And I'll get it closer. And so what I'm trying to do is quickly locate stuff. And it's really important to get your, the parts of this thing located early uh, before you start worrying about the details because um, 
if, it's, if the stuff isn't located properly, all the good details in the world won't save it. The proportions will still be bad. So I'm using these various tools to give me the shapes I want. I always try to use the biggest one possible because if it has a very wide blade, you won't get a lot of little tool marks. So ideally, you have a tool almost for each cut. Um, because if you don't use the tool that's appropriate for the shape that you're doing, <clears throat> it's just, you'll have to go back and do it again. So, for each, for each thing that I carve, I make a little, a little board with all the tools cut into it, and then I write next to it which tools I use. So when I go back and do it again, I can figure out, use the same tools. And what happens is that a lot of times I'll start out with 40 tools on my bench to start a job, and then as I work through the through the carving, I'll uh, I'll narrow it down to fewer tools to the point where I ideally have you know small numbers possible really. So I'll just take a couple more cuts and then show you. Sharpening? Oh yeah. Yep. Yeah, you've got to sharpen stuff all the time. Not all the time, but you know, regularly. And so what I've done here is these little points here are going to be knuckles. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three there. The back one really just has one and then it scoops in. And so what I've done is I've rounded the tops of these off a little bit and I've I dug deep next to them to separate them out from the ball. So in carving, if you want something to stick out, you have to lower what's around it. Obviously, you can't pull it out of the wood. So in order to make something high, you have to make what, what's next to it low. Um, and so initially, I'm just trying to establish these heights. Um, that's the most critical thing in doing a job, carving job is figuring out what's higher, what's low, what's the highest, what's the lowest, and what are all the stages in between. And so I'm just feeling my, my way around here. And look now I'm looking at the circle on the bottom because I'm going to start making the ball. And that's where the ball will touch the floor. So I'm taking these claws down as close to that line and leave a little bit extra to fudge around with later. I want to get pretty close to that line. It's kind of like a little rhythmical dance that you do in your car. Get into a pattern. It's really a rhythm. So once I do that, I'm going to start rounding off the ball because I've, so I've got all this stuff located now. And so the flat spaces in between them will become the ball. So I'm going to start rounding these off. And you really, the most important thing I need to know when I do that is where's the equator? Because the equator of the ball is where, you know, above it I go to the North Pole, below it I go to the South Pole. This particular ball and claw has a very flat ball. This is a Boston style. Let's see, who's got a Boston style one there? Yes, that one. See how, see how flat they are? Let me grab that. Well, not so much, but. Let's see, what do you got? <laughs> no, nope, neither one of those. <laughs> this one? I'll use this one. Uh, this one's actually as close. Maybe the one Peter's got. Is that? No, nope. I'll just use this. <laughs> I can explain this. Um, on some of these, they have a very <coughs> tall, skinny ball. On the, on the ones in Boston, they tend to chop it off low. This one's a little high, even. They tend to chop it off a little lower. So you can even see this one would be a Boston one. And it really starts arcing out almost immediately from the floor, whereas some of them undercut as they approach the floor. So the Boston ones have a, have a flatter section on the bottom of them. And so, the, and so what I was getting is the equator is very